The following presentation examines the aftermath of the terrible disaster at Fredericksburg, Virginia in December 1862. We will hear from General Ambrose Burnside himself, in his own words, soon after his crushing defeat. It's December 11, 1862. Union General Ambrose Burnside has brought the Army of the Potomac to Falmouth, Virginia on the Rappahannock River. We will zoom into the area. Falmouth is across the Rappahannock River from Fredericksburg. At Burnside's command is the giant Union Army of the Potomac. What Burnside had intended to be a rapid movement across the river was bogged down by a delay in pontoon bridges. Meanwhile, Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia has had plenty of time to prepare for the crossing. Burnside does cross the Rappahannock River and secure the town. However, the subsequent attempt to secure the heights beyond town, as well as the high ground below town, are a complete disaster. Multiple blue waves are repulsed, resulting in a horrifically one-sided defeat for the Union Army. Unable to dislodge the rebel defenders, the bloodied Army of the Potomac is forced to recross the Rappahannock River to the Falmouth side. At 4 a.m. on December 16, 1862, Burnside sends a telegraph to Major General Halleck in Washington. It reads, I have thought it necessary to withdraw the Army to this side of the river, and the movement has progressed satisfactorily thus far. General Halleck responds from Washington that day. His tone is short and pointed. The message reads, The President desires that you report the reasons of your withdrawal as soon as possible. That evening on December 16, Burnside transmits a response to Halleck. Burnside states, The Army was withdrawn to this side of the river because I felt the positions in front could not be carried and it was a military necessity either to attack or retire. A repulse would have been disastrous to us. I hope this explanation will be satisfactory to the President. The Army was withdrawn at night without the knowledge of the enemy and without loss either of property or men. Burnside knew he had been beaten badly. He remains at Falmouth as December progresses, the Army of the Potomac subject to winter's cold weather, rain, and mud. Burnside's report to Washington, composed the next day on December 17, contains a mixture of admiration for his men as well as a deep guilt and regret for his own decisions. Here is General Ambrose Burnside, candid in his own words, the day after his retreat across the Rappahannock. Headquarters, Army of the Potomac, December 17, 1862. I have the honor to offer the following reasons for moving the Army of the Potomac across the Rappahannock sooner than was anticipated by the President, Secretary, or yourself, and for crossing at a point different from the one indicated to you at our last meeting at the President's. During my preparations for crossing at the place I had first selected, I discovered that the enemy had thrown a large portion of his force down the river and elsewhere, thus weakening his defenses in front. And I also thought I discovered that he did not anticipate the crossing of our whole force at Fredericksburg, and I hoped, by rapidly throwing the whole command over at that place, to separate by vigorous attack the forces of the enemy on the river below from the forces behind and on the crests in the rear of town, in which case we should fight him with great advantages in our favor. To do this we had to gain a height on the extreme right of the crest, which height commanded a new road, lately built by the enemy for purposes of a more rapid communication along his lines. Which point gained, his positions along the crest would have been scarcely tenable, and he would have been driven from them easily by an attack on his front, in connection with the movement in rear of the crest. How near we came to accomplishing our object, future reports will show. But for the fog and unexpected and unavoidable delay in building the bridges, which gave the enemy 24 hours more to concentrate his forces in strong positions, we would almost certainly have succeeded, in which case the battle would have been, in my opinion, far more decisive than if we had crossed at the places first selected. As it was, 
we came very near success. Failing in accomplishing the main object, we remained in order of battle two days, long enough to decide that the enemy would not come out of his strongholds and fight us with his infantry, after which we were crossed to this side of the river unmolested and without the loss of men or property. As the day broke, our long lines of troops were seen marching to their different positions as if going on parade. Not the least demoralization or disorganization existed. To the brave officers and soldiers who accomplished the feat of this recrossing in the face of the enemy, I owe everything. For the failure in the attack, I am responsible, as the extreme gallantry, courage, and endurance shown by them was never excelled, and would have carried the points had it been possible. To the families and friends of the dead, I can only offer my heartfelt sympathy, but for the wounded, I can offer my earnest prayers for their comfort and final recovery. The fact that I decided to move from Warrington onto this line, rather than against the opinion of the President, Secretary, and yourself, and that you have left the whole management in my hands without giving me orders, makes me the more responsible. I will visit you very soon and give you more definite information, and finally will send you my detailed report, in which a special acknowledgment will be made of the services of the different Grand Divisions, Corps, and my general and personal staff departments of the Army of the Potomac, to whom I am much indebted for their hearty support and cooperation. I will add here that the movement was made earlier than you expected, and after the President, Secretary, and yourself requested me not to be in haste, for the reason that we were supplied much sooner by the different staff departments than we anticipated when I last saw you. Our killed amounted to 1,152. Our wounded, about 9,000. Our prisoners, about 700, which have been paroled and exchanged for about the same number taken by us. The wounded were all removed to this side of the river before the evacuation and are being well cared for, and the dead were all buried under a flag of truce. The surgeon reports a much larger proportion than usual of slight wounds, 1,630, only being treated in hospitals. I am glad to represent the Army at the present time in good condition. Thanking the government for that entire support and confidence which I have always received from them, I remain, General, very respectfully, your obedient servant, A. E. Burnside, Major General, Commanding Army of the Potomac. A few days later, in what one Union officer called the Valley Forge of the War, a letter from Washington was returned to Burnside's headquarters. The letter reads, I have just read your commanding general's report of the Battle of Fredericksburg. Although you were not successful, the attempt was not an error, nor the failure other than accident. The courage with which you, in an open field, maintained the contest against an entrenched foe, and the consummate skill and success with which you crossed and recrossed the river in the face of the enemy, show that you possess all the qualities of the great army, which will yet give victory to the cause of the country and of popular government. Condoling with the mourners for the dead and sympathizing with the s severely wounded, I congratulate you that the number of both is comparatively so small. I tender to you, officers and soldiers, the thanks of the nation. This letter, dated December 22nd, came from the executive mansion in Washington where it had been composed by President Abraham Lincoln. One month later, Abraham Lincoln accepted Burnside's resignation and the command of the Army of the Potomac fell to Joseph Hooker.